It's a pan-human artefact. It's, uh, for the length and breadth of humanity, these boats have been a mainstay of our transport, leisure, fulfilling the human urge to go where we can't naturally get to. This is the mighty sparrow, named after the Calypso King. That's a 14-foot poplar log. I've got a long bar chainsaw and cut the V-shaped bottom. With a chainsaw mill, I start cutting out great big pieces of timber all the way through, taking off the hard lines with a side axe here, and then planing the outside form down, and then getting to the inside here and digging wood out. See, it's starting to follow the outside form of the boat. Finer work with a mallet and chisel. It's a gouge, a big curved gouge. I'm just doing big curled cuts all around there. And I'm leaving this block of wood in the middle to keep the sides firm. By the time you start to carving down there, the sides are getting quite floppy. So by leaving a big block, it just keeps it firm. So then we've, I've carved it down here to a, about a finger thickness, and I'm just starting to take out the middle block. This is the top edge of the deck. They're only about 12 inches apart at that. That would be a very unstable, very unpleasant boat to go in. That's my way of adapting the old techniques to the modern trees that we have now, which are much smaller than people would have had access to in the old days. It's lighter, it's springier, it's very abundant, and there's no market for poplar anymore. Then that's with the block removed. Block the ends up with plywood boards. So they've got little brackets just to hold them in place, and then they're clamped together using a tourniquet. A bonfire is lit, and I heat up brake discs transfers a hot brake disc with this metal spike and puts it in the water, making lots of lovely steam. It's a wonderful noise when those go in. And after about an hour and a half, you've actually got a boat full of boiling water. That's the point at which we wrap it up and insulate it. So you're trying to get the wood as warm as possible, but not without, uh, obviously without overboiling it. Then I start putting in these planks with notches on and you pull the side of the boat out a little bit and you drop the plank down one notch and you do that the whole length of the boat. The planks are getting wider and wider and the boat is stretching out more and more. But it's about a three hour process. Here I am putting in the last of these stretches and you can see how wide the boat is now. You just have to sense when the boat will go no further without splitting. And so from a, a parallel sided, very narrow boat, you actually have something that is proper boat shape. And that's all of, these, all of these braces giving a nice even pressure over the hull. Take the water out and you leave the whole wood to dry out for, for quite a few weeks. Leave it outside to air and that stiffens the wood. You're imposing on the tree to make this thing happen on the one hand. On the other hand, the tree is talking to you and saying, if you do it like this, it ain't going to work. Even with a brutal chainsaw, you're still responding very much to the tree and what it, what it offers you. The next stage is to block the ends up. This is a piece of the, the same tree jointed into place right here to make a cap for the bottom part. And the top piece, so part of the, it holds it all together and it leaves room for a nice bit of decorative carving. And that completes the hull. In the old days, there was no end of huge oak trees and nobody thought twice about chopping them down. I mean, now all those trees are protected and that's a, that's a good thing. The aim of, of what I'm doing here is to take that ancient technology and translate it into, into modern days with the trees that we can use safely, or commercially produced trees. This is a locker, it secures very nicely here. This is the, one of the main braces for the hull. It's dovetailed into a notch of wood that was left as an extra thickness on the hull. So you can see the dovetail in there, then pegged it. And it also serves as the brace for the mast. The dagger board is um, an essential part of sailing kit because it stops the boat from just sliding sideways when you're sailing into or alongside the wind. You have to be constantly balancing the boat because it wants to fall over and you have to stop it from doing that. But then when I'm rowing the boat, this comes out and I put this piece in like that and I can row quite comfortably without getting a wet bum. <laughs> oak has a lot more strength than poplar so for the structural items I use off cuts of oak. This is all oak, that's all oak. Uh, the transom here that's set in to seal the end of the hull, that's oak. 
And then that's another poplar sort of top piece to hold it all together. And that's the tail of the, the sparrow. These seats here are curved, partly for comfort and then also for stability. It gets your centre of gravity lower. You feel like you're wearing the boat. So when it rocks, you're not being thrown from side to side. And then when the wind is really blowing, you sit right up on the edge and lean out and counterbalance the, uh, <coughs> the desire of the boat to fall over. You consider doing like it's a completely feasible way of making a contemporary leisure boat out of the small commercially produced trees or available trees and renewable trees that we have access to now. You consider doing like one on side and then one on the other. Every trip on the Thames is an adventure, truly. You know, even just a two hour up and down the river is like you learn something new and you can feel your heart in your mouth. <laughs> Alive. Yeah, or oh, you feel alive, all right, and you, you want to hang on to that. 